highly appreciated and highly applauded and highly encouraged. Uh, so for you all to come here, uh, it's, special, it's very special to us. Now, uh, having said that, I don't know where to begin because if you have brought your blankets, we will spend till midnight. I can go on speaking on all the issues and all the topics that you are here. But given the limited time, uh, you know, I thought I should say less and then if some of you express your interest to ask some questions. And that might be a better option. Because yesterday, uh, we got a bit late in uh, Brussels because we had a meeting. It's an ending at 7.15, and it ended at 8.50 or something like that. So it's a living thing between 7.30. We had to take on 9.30 trains. By the time we reached here, uh, 10.45, 15, hundreds of people had come to the uh, train station. It was quite moving. But I've just gone off from my seat in the train, you know. But it was good to see the presence. By the time we had dinner, it was at midnight at Ramblin Square, a large disco uh, uh, kind of uh, restaurant. Yeah. So I don't want to repeat it again. But it was memorable that I was at Ramblin Square at dinner at midnight. But I think uh, I want to have the dinner early so that I can catch up with some sleep at night and then uh, go on doing things tomorrow. But I'm sure you all also want to uh, get on with your Friday evening somewhere else and spend with me uh, in a boring uh, way listening to my speech. A uh, few things I want to uh, say uh, is that uh, one, in the last uh, three years since I took over, you know, we went through uh, historic and uh, also ground uh, transition. But it's at that time, people were very anxious as to why we decided that to you know, separate the church and the state and uh, involve all this political authority to and uh, the Tibetans went through um, quite a bit of anxiousness and also nervousness as to how we might uh, deal with this major transition. And sometimes I jokingly say it's true. My mother was more worried about the transition than my potential uh, election because she thought how I would manage and all the Tibetans went through it. But the last three years, as for the vision and advice of the Solidus, uh, it has uh, uh, been uh, gone through quite smoothly that uh, transition. No, no, no major hiccups or uh, major challenges uh, along the way. Not so much because of my way or my team of seven uh, colleges, but mainly because of the support we have received from the best people inside and outside. Yesterday, because it was my first trip to the Netherlands, uh, so many people showed up at the train station, mainly because, not because of why I am, I'm just a simple guy. I will be an ordinary person when I finish my term. But of course, the symbol that I have given back is very exciting. The same thing in Brussels, Germany, very viable, the love and support. All the Tibetan administration has been really, really good. And from inside Tibet also, um, I'm uh, sometimes it's quite puzzling uh, to read me. I don't know, uh, sometimes it's sad. It sends singles of couple songs. And put it on YouTube uh, with English translation, and a few my really arrested. And the song is obviously in praise of the Solonists, in, in, in praise of the uh, a transition, and in, in mentioning my name. And so pe people are risking their lives uh, to do all these things, sending <coughs> letters and prayers, and all that, to show uh, solidarity uh, shown by Tibetans inside and outside Tibet. In that sense, the transition is going on quite smoothly. In that sense, I think Tibet inside and outside Tibet have this some sense of feeling that perhaps we can handle this, you know, perhaps we can walk as per the vision of the Solomon's dialogue and take responsibilities ourselves and then move forward um, uh, with the democracy system that we have and democratic elected leadership will provide the political and secular leadership moving forward. Uh, so that's what the Solomon's wanted and three years ago, we went through a bit of nervousness, but now uh, there's a bit of a calming effect, and then slowly uh, Tibetans are uh, you know, actually realizing there's a bit of a uh, confidence that perhaps we can move forward um, as per the vision of the Solomon's. 
And then I think there's a political maturity on the part of that people, and also taking responsibilities uh, very seriously. So, and then most encouraging is the third generation of Tibetans inside Tibet, and the younger generation of Tibetans outside Tibet have been very, very active. So that is very encouraging. Why I say this is, as far as I'm concerned, of course I'm Tibetan, we all should be dedicated to the Tibetan cause. But my um, direct involvement in the Tibetan movement uh, was in 1789, when there was a major uprising in Tibet, particularly in Hassan, and there was martial laws in post. So I was a student at Delhi University, so we frequented the Chinese embassy uh, quite a few times and uh, was very familiar with the police station nearby, you know, so did not say that, but quite uh, familiar. So I uh, really got involved in the Tibetan um, activist world. So that got me uh, engaged throughout for decades now. So that passion, that fire was still burning. So when I uh, got elected, but then, um, since 2001, and there has been many protests led by Tibetans inside Tibet, including uh, Kim Bo Jingmi, uh, Pinzo, and others, in the sense uh, the, the renaissance of uh, Tibetan religion and culture and language inside Tibet, uh, including uh, you know, the Hakka movement, uh, where every Wednesday, <coughs> where Tibetan eat Tibetan, uh, do Tibetan, think Tibetan, things like that. Um, but particularly, uh, what is most uh, uh, encouraging is that the younger generation of Tibetans uh, outside, since the nationwide uprising uh, in Tibet in 2008 and 2009, unfortunately we had a uh, certain Malaysia, but 2011, 12, 13, 14, now 132 Tibetans have burned themselves, you know, of which uh, uh, sadly 113 have uh, passed away. As far as Tibet administration is concerned, we have consistently and categorically discouraged the action of such Malaysian because life is precious. Having said that, we support uh, the aspirations of all the such Malaysians and all the protesters inside Tibet because the aspiration of Tibet inside Tibet is exactly the same as aspirations of Tibet outside, which is return of the Solomon's dialogue to Tibet and freedom uh, for uh, Tibetans. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is since 2008, there has been major protests inside Tibet. Now the younger generation of Tibetans, even though they were born and brought up, let's say, in America or in the Netherlands or Europe or anywhere, they are so involved and so engaged in the Tibetan cause, so hence the political activism and awareness is very high. So I can clearly see this younger generation of Tibetans who are in the teens and 20s will take forward and provide leadership to the Tibetan world and to the Tibetan movement for years to come. I am a residue of 1987, 88, 84. These people, you know, since 2008, 9, 10, now for five years, they are more engaged uh, than we were, uh, we were, uh, than we were. So I can clearly see the leadership coming henceforth will be far better educated, far better talented, far better exposed than I or any one of us uh, here. So in that sense, the prospect for the Tibetan leadership in years to come and decades to come is really strong. And they are going to the best universities, uh, they are multi-talented, you know, so I can clearly see, uh, I'm happy that I took over now, uh, in the decades to come, I think there will be fierce competition among themselves, but the best one to come and, you know, uh, provide the leadership. In that sense, I'm very encouraged. So our job is to make sure this transition goes well as per the vision of a solidist dilemma. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, we are doing quite well. But inside Tibet, the situation continues to be grim. We all know just recently there was two such relations, September 16 and 17, which coincided with the President Xi Jinping's visit to India. So we thought uh, there were 12 set in, uh, in 2012, and the most uh, took place in 2013, some 80, uh, some. and then 2014, we thought it might end, if uh, it at least, but so far we already have <coughs> eight, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that shows that the uh, situation is um, 
quite uh, desperate insight to that. In that sense, life is very precious. You know, uh, to give up one's life is not that easy at all. Now, the Tibetans to come to that conclusion uh, is, in, on the one sense, is sad. Uh, on the other hand, it is also a determination on their part that they want to protest in that form. Now, the cause of the self revolution we all should know, it's very clear. The continued occupation of Tibet and repression of Tibetans, that is forcing Tibetans to take this action. And also, if you study the genesis of protest, you can clearly see why. If you have a simple protest, you get arrested, you go to prison, you get tortured, often you disappear. So when the consequences are so harsh, people are choosing to die quickly, then suffer prolonged for a long time in prison and 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 and, and, and die uh, uh, anyways, you know. So we can clearly see the causes. Um, so given the really sad tragedy unfolding in Tibet, the unity of Tibetans inside and outside uh, have never been stronger. The sense of solidarity have never been higher uh, inside and outside. And the political maturity inside and outside also is really, really high. Uh, so, so these are the to me when I was in high school, when I was in college, through the Department of Education. Um, and then because of the scholarship, I managed to uh, complete my uh, college education. And because of full graduate scholarship, I managed to go to Harvard Law School and you know, con uh, complete my uh, education. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you think that. The, the small or big uh, funding of two million or five million dollars or fifty thousand dollars or five thousand dollars per percent uh, to a Tibetan project, whether it's in Munich or anywhere. Uh, if you think that uh, what has happened to it, whether there's any uh, result or not, I think when you see the Tibetan leadership in exile, uh, you can clearly see the result of your uh, funding. Uh, it has been made possible. And uh, to have uh, so many organizations in the Netherlands, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, also demonstrates that uh, 100,000 active members for various organizations for one country, uh, it's quite a lot. I think if you go by ratio-wise, <coughs> maybe the Netherlands maybe has a distinction of being the highest in the whole world as far as the, uh, uh, Tibetan movement is concerned. Then, uh, then I, on my part, I made a mistake. I should have come here first. <laughs> Last leg of a visit, actually, after the Netherlands went to Spain. And then I think after Spain, I must have more or less covered 90 percent of Tibetans mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will be going to Montreal, Vermont, Wisconsin, and New Mexico. Then I would have covered 90 percent of Tibetans in North America. I've already covered. All the settlements, all the schools, most of the monasteries, all the old homes, except Sikkim, I've covered all. Mm -hmm. So in the last few years, the fact that you have not seen me here does not mean I was not doing anything. I was really <laughs> running around from pillar to post, uh, meeting uh, with Tibetans, assuring them and encouraging them that we are uh, we've all uh, got to do, uh, you know, uh, as per the vision of the soldiers. So that I want to say quickly, the Tibetan administration, as you know, we follow little bit policy, uh, which is to seek genuine autonomy within China, within the framework of the Chinese constitution. Now some say, uh, well, there has been no dialogue uh, with the Chinese government, so far there's no breakthrough, hence uh, they ask the question as to uh, where is the middle way approach. But, Middle way approach have been, in some, in many sense, has been a brilliant strategy as far as Tibet is concerned, as per the vision of the Soviets. Because uh, one direct benefit of you know advocating middle way is, if you in comparative context, if you look at Taiwan, Taiwan, between Taiwan and China, there's one China issue, and whether Taiwan is advocating independence or not, and then China says so, because of that dispute. The Taiwanese leader, the president, uh, is restricted from visiting different countries. Have you ever seen a president of Taiwan coming to the Netherlands mm -hmm. or him visiting uh, America? Uh, if uh, Taiwan's uh, president has to go to South America, uh, Latin America, 
if his plane has to stop over in America, he can land in any of the airports and change the fuel. But technically, he's not supposed to get out of the airport. You know, he can get, now sometimes they allow him to get out of the airport and the hotel. But why? Because of this one China dispute. Because of whether Taiwan is seeking independence or not. And as far as my position, my colleagues, colleagues, we can travel anywhere in Europe or uh, in America, anywhere, mainly because we follow middle way, we follow unbiased. Our, our, our stand is very clear. And all, you know, once we form the government, once we are charged, <coughs> that's what we want. Essentially, the message sent from inside Tibet is all the people in the Netherlands, yes, you got to meet him, you feel special, you, you were blessed by him, but we are the peasants. We in Tibet would like exactly the same thing that you had. So that's what they want to see. But on a daily basis, hundreds and thousands of Tibetans are dying at the generation, hoping and wishing and praying that they get to see his son, that they get to feel him, that they be blessed by him before they, they leave this world. In the last 50 plus years, and, uh, millions have left us without fulfilling their, their dream, their desire. And I think uh, it is our sacred duty to make sure that very soon uh, their, their dream is fulfilled. Happy days that you had when you saw this visit the Netherlands. Mr. Shield, we are working in the far northwestern part of Switzerland. Typically, the children there do not go to school, and even if they attend Chinese public school, they do not learn very much. I've met many young people there who, after six years of working in Chinese school, couldn't read or write their own name. You know the, the environment of Tibetan people is changing very rapidly, especially the nomads, because they have to sell their stock and live in barracks for which they have to pay. Go to Tibet. That has been our consistent demand and appeal that uh, each government uh, should try to send their ambassadors from Beijing to visit Tibet if possible, the United Nations as well. And as far as UNSCI is concerned, uh, the previous uh, uh, <coughs> commissioner, Namit uh, Lee, she also uh, made these efforts, and she also wrote to them. And uh, in principle, the Chinese government has agreed to, uh, to allow that visit. So the present commissioner is continuing with the same uh, proposal of the previous human rights commissioner. And then they've been negotiating for some time. Now, negotiation with Chinese government sometimes takes a long time. So but the fact that he revealed it in the press conference, that the fact that he's uh, uh, hopeful uh, is a positive sign. And hopefully it does take place. That is all the, all, all the better. And yes, just two days ago, yesterday, we were told that the, uh, the the ambassador of uh, the Netherlands actually also visited Tibet. Uh, he was allowed to visit Tibet, so low profile, was all the stage managed and all that. But nonetheless, every visit is positive for us in the sense one is a stage managed. Um, I'll share, I'll share, as you know, an interesting story. Uh, so one one person happened to join two delegations. So the first delegation goes to Tibet. They were shown an all stage managed. Somehow this driver says, you know, now you're, you're going through all these trips and meeting all these people. Do you want an, you know, uh, what do you call it, impromptu or unorganized trip to a village nearby and meet the real Tibetans? And they all were excited, yes. So they all drove to the village and met some family members, you know. But then this one person happened to be in the next delegation also. So again, the next delegation went through all the stations on this trip. But then the driver said the same thing. Do you want an impromptu you know, uh, trip to a village and then meet real people? <laughs> then you went to the same village. So even the impromptu. So uh, <laughs> in, in many sense, when you have a formal delegation visiting Tibet, uh, uh, they all know that. Nonetheless, the message Tibet inside Tibet take is, well, we have an important official coming here to Tibet, so this 
people care what's happening to us. On the other hand, it also is an acknowledgement on the part of the Chinese government that they have to deal with the rest of the world and show it to the rest of the world what's happening in Tibet uh, as part of their uh, justification. You know? So we welcome if the Human Rights Commissioner can go to Tibet. We encourage it, in fact, we demand it. So in many sense, the ambassador of the Netherlands uh, has already uh, been to Tibet, which I'm don't write uh, about him because we were just told in confidence. Uh, but anyone who can go to it, I know the foreign minister of Australia went, uh, ambassador, US ambassador definitely went, uh, Swiss ambassador. So we always urge ambassadors and uh, you foreign know, dignitaries to go inside to that. We are trying, but still, we are still left with that chunk of students who don't get scholarship that who are, who, who, who can't complete, uh, can't do college. And if you don't go to college, then diploma is very difficult to do in India. So we are trying to set up a call center. We have already have one call center in Umani, in Paramsal. We want to replicate them in different parts of the settlement, but the Melbourne and Melbourne, because of lack of 24 hours, uh, city and the uh, internet access, we are not able to replicate. So we are also coming up some other vocational projects, things like that. And then, you know, they, they, they can go to Ilamangalam. We have one special training in Ilamangalam near Bangalore, where the capacity is, uh, is full now. They are now so waiting this. So we are trying to create vocational training. So we are trying. Uh, having said that, it's not that easy. Even if you want help, it's not that easy to help. But despite all the challenges, you are contributing your time, energy, putting in a lot of efforts. Uh, which means a lot to us. Uh, as the Solomons always say, we Tibetans have nothing to give you, really, <laughs> uh, nothing whatsoever. Um, maybe if you if you meet with Rinpoche and monks, then perhaps they can give you a little bit better karma for your next life. <laughs> <laughs> and we lay, lay people, we have nothing to offer. <laughs> and, and then uh, what you do, uh, what you what you do, what you contribute is simply. Uh, uh, out of your conviction and out of your generosity and out of your compassion uh, because you believe in justice, you believe in the right thing and the given circumstances we are in where governments are also uh, under tremendous pressure and they are changing, even individuals are changing, you know. Uh, as I gave you the example of a friend of the Tibetan parliamentary group, uh, uh, soon after taking over the position of power, uh, changes that you This is the day and age now, and that shows not so much uh, a reflection of that person, uh, but mainly because of the pressure, the amount of pressure the Chinese government put on them. You know, so even the good people change their heart because of the pressure. Uh, and then, uh, despite all the pressure and difficulties and challenges, uh, you folks, the good folks, are still with us. Uh, that is our strength, and that is our. Uh, source of inspiration. Uh, even though I've taken over three uh, plus years ago, I'm a totally new guy uh, in this world because I, I, I spent 16 years in America. I've never worked in Dharamsala even for a single day. So when I took over uh, the political leadership, I knew the challenges were many. Uh, but nonetheless, wherever I travel, the, for me, the source of inspiration and encouragement was like me, 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 meeting people like you. Even Friday evening, you all show up and say, hey, I know this guy has nothing to say and maybe he'll give a boring speech. Nonetheless, we'll show up here for Tibet and Tibetan people for his solemnness there. That demonstration uh, means a lot, uh, not just to, you know, to our representatives, but to all the Tibetans inside Tibet. So in that sense, you all are a true friend of the Tibetan people, but also a believer uh, in justice and truth. And one day soon, I do believe, I firmly believe, that our day will come sooner than later. When that day comes, it will be mainly because of you folks. So thank you very much.